Well, we welcome all of you who are joining us uh, online and those of you who are meeting together here at Central Campus, along with others of you meeting at one of our other campuses in South Calgary, Bridgeland, Airdrie, and Bears Paw. Today we continue our study in the book of Revelation, and I, so I invite you to turn your Bibles to Revelation 17. Now let me ask you, when you think about the city of Ottawa, what thoughts and images come to your mind? Now I realize by bringing up the city of Ottawa, I may have pressed one of your hot buttons, so please, you know, don't let out your inner voice right now. Just make a mental note. When I refer to the city of Las Vegas, what kind of thoughts and images come to mind? Now, those of you who are familiar with the Bible, when I refer to the city of Babylon, what kind of thoughts and images come to mind? Now, Babylon was an ancient city that became the largest, the wealthiest, and the most powerful empire in the world between the 7th and the 6th century before Christ and was located in what is now Iraq. The city is most notable in the Bible for conquering Jerusalem and the southern kingdom of Judah and taking many of the Israelites into captivity around 586 BC. Now the Bible refers to Babylon 280 times and in the same way that Las Vegas is often referred to or thought of as Sin City, whenever Babylon is mentioned in scripture it is used mostly as a symbol of wickedness and worldliness and rebellion and defiance against God. Well, that is the way the name Babylon is used in Revelation 17 and 18, which we're examining today. Now, to understand the origins of Babylon and where its reputation for rejecting God started, we need to go back over 4,000 years to Genesis 11, at around 2000 BC. Now we read there that after the flood, Noah and his family began to repopulate the earth. And verse 1 says that the whole earth used the same language, which is understandable because they were from the same family. This allowed them to progress rapidly and to become powerful. And over time, they became a very proud people who focused much on their ability and on their ingenuity. And somewhere along the way, as Paul says in Romans chapter 1, these people no longer worshiped the true creator, but began to worship the things that God created. And verse 4 says that they began to worship themselves and their accomplishments rather than giving God the glory and consulting God, they began to consult the stars for wisdom. In fact, historians tell us that at the top of the tower was placed the sign of the zodiac. Priests were then ordained who, through the use of ancient zodiac, were supposed to chart the course of the stars and therefore gain wisdom and read the future. The God of the universe was there for them to consult and for them to embrace, but they rejected God and they went their own way, embracing the dark side and the power and the ways of Satan. They were building a monument, not to God, but to themselves. Again, in verse 4, it says, they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. In other words, they were saying, Let's build a city and a society without God. We're so great and we're so smart, we can be our own gods. And God dealt with their rebellion by confusing their language 
And when they talked to each other, it sounded like the other was babbling nonsense. And thus we get the name Babel and the Tower of Babel and ultimately Babylon. And by confusing their language, God scattered them over the earth. And so when Babylon is referred to here in Revelation 17 and 18, it's intended to illustrate the spirit and the mindset of the people toward God back in Genesis 11. Babylon is the symbol of all worldly opposition to Jesus Christ and his kingdom. Sam Storms writes, in ancient times, Babylon was Sodom and Gomorrah, Egypt, Nineveh, and Rome. More recently, Babylon was Nazi Germany, China, China under Mao, Soviet Russia under Stalin, North Korea and Iran, and even Western nations like Canada. To whatever extent our nation resists and is in opposition to the kingdom of Christ. Babylon is political corruption and economic and sexual exploitation and the sex industry in general. Babylon is religious liberalism and progressivism that no longer respects, believes the Bible or parts of the Bible to be true and from God. Now, Revelation 17 and 18 describes the fall and the destruction of the religion of Babylon and the economic and political power of Babylon and the end of those who defiantly oppose and reject God. In these two chapters, we are taken back to the final bold judgments in chapter 16, and we're given an expanded picture and a closer look. It's like a zoom lens that goes in closer uh, to have a closer look at God's wrath directed at those who have embraced the mindset and the spirit of Babylon. Which brings us to chapter 17. And if you have read it like I requested you would, then you know it isn't easy to understand or interpret. But let's jump in anyways and ask God to give us his understanding and wisdom. So look at verse 1 and 2, in which John sees the image of a great harlot. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits by many waters. With her the kings of the earth committed adultery and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. Now the vision that John sees in this chapter involves two main characters, the harlot and the beast, or the Antichrist. And it's important to point out that even though Babylon has a variety of expressions, the two that are the most prominent is its political and economic face and its religious face. The scarlet beast on which the harlot sits is a symbol for the political and economic face of Babylon, while the harlot is a symbol for the religious face of Babylon. And we know that because in verse 5 it says this, the name written on her forehead was a mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. <clears throat> now we also know that the harlot is a symbol for the religion of Babylon because we read in verse 2 that she commits sexual immorality and in Revelation, sexual immorality is a metaphorical way of describing religious apostasy and idolatry. Now that doesn't exclude literal sexual immorality, but the main point is she has rejected the one true God and replaced him with an idol or a false god. 
in the same way that Israel was unfaithful at times and lapsed into the worship of other gods. Now, verse 1 tells us that she is sitting on many waters, which according to verse 15 refers to multitudes of people and nations, which means that her false religion and system of idolatry will be worldwide. In verse 4, we're told she is dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones, and pearls. This is all intended to evoke a picture of seduction. The harlot uses her beauty to seduce leaders in power, but also the multitudes, to embrace her false religion, to reject and oppose the true God. She is seducing them to take the good gifts and the resources that God gave them and instead of using it to glorify God and to advance his kingdom purposes, they use it to gratify themselves and to do evil. It's a powerful reminder that we all have the natural fleshly inclination at times to turn from our God and to run after the things of the world. Then look at verse 3. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. This attractive harlot not only symbolizes worldly seduction, but she is sitting on a scarlet beast that symbolizes worldly power and persecution. Throughout the Bible, and especially in Revelation, scarlet, or the color red, is a picture of Satan and a picture of sin. This tells us that the power behind the harlot and also behind the beast or the Antichrist is the devil himself. It's a reminder that the source of all evil and the power behind the world system is Satan. Now, when John saw the harlot, he was greatly astonished. And we read in verse 7, Then the angel said to me, Why are you astonished? I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that she rides, which has the seven heads and ten horns. The beast which you saw once was, now is not, and yet will come up out of the abyss and go to its destruction. The inhabitants of the earth, whose names have not been written in the book of life, from the creation of the world, will be astonished when they see the beast, because it once was, now is not, and yet will come. Now, as I mentioned last time, the beast is the second member of the unholy trinity. Satan loves to mimic God. The first member of the unholy trinity is the dragon, Satan himself. The second member is the beast, sometimes referred to as the Antichrist, which could be a person or a system of economic and political power that is under the control of Satan. And the third member is the false prophet which represents religious and spiritual powers manipulated by Satan and is portrayed in Revelation 17 as the harlot. Now, the harlot sits on the beast, which indicates there is likely some form of alliance between the apostate religious world system and the political economic system of power all of them controlled by Satan. The beast has seven heads and ten horns, according to this scripture. Heads are a symbol of authority. Horns are a symbol of power and strength. The beast or the Antichrist has great authority and strength. We read in verse 9 that the seven heads 
are seven hills on which the woman sits. They are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come, but when he does come, he must remain for only a little while. The beast who once was, is not, is an eighth king. He belongs to the seven and is going to his destruction. Now, when the early church first read this passage, they most likely would have associated the beast with the Roman Empire because it was known as the city on seven hills or the city of seven hills. However, in verse 10, the angel goes on to say that the seven heads of the beast are not only seven hills, but also seven empires and the, or kings. And the, and the question is, who are they? Well, again, there is much speculation around this, but I believe Daniel chapter 2 gives us the best explanation. Some of you will remember that in Daniel's vision of the statue, he pictured four kingdoms, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome. Now, prior to these four major world empires, there were two others, Egypt and Assyria. So we have, in order, the following six world empires, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome. In verse 10, the angel says that five have fallen. That would be Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Media, Persia, and Greece. The angel goes on to say that one is, which at the time that John was writing this, would have been Rome. The other, we're told here, is yet to come, which likely is referring to the future worldwide kingdom of the beast or the Antichrist. Now notice the angel first makes reference to the fact that the seventh world leader only remains for a while. Now you may remember, I'm sure that all of you remember all these details, I just know you are. Um, you may remember when we were introduced to the beast or the Antichrist back in chapter 13 that the beast appears to have a fatal wound but then is healed again. In other words, he faked his death and resurrection which may be what verse 10 is actually referring to. That's why twice here in chapter 17 you have the Antichrist described as once was now is not, <coughs> then is again. So when the beast or the Antichrist is called the seventh king in verse 10 and then the eighth king in verse 11, it would appear that he is called the seventh king before his fake death and the eighth king after his fake resurrection. And I say that because verse 11 tells us that we're talking about the same person. It says here, he belongs to the seven and is going to his destruction. Okay, so how are you all doing up to this point in time? <laughs> are you still tracking with me? Yeah, 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 I can tell. You're just, you're just beaming with understanding. <laughs> so let's add to your confusion. What about the ten horns that are described in verse 12? Well, the ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but who for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. Now, I want you to note two key phrases here. First, verse 12 says, These ten kings have not yet received a kingdom. That means that this isn't something taking place at the time that John wrote this to the early church. In other words, the beast may be a symbol for Rome and its various emperors who persecuted the church and demanded to be worshipped. But the beast is more than ancient Rome and the ancient Roman Empire. 
John is describing something in the future here. At the end of the age, the beast will be a final manifestation of evil in the form of a person or perhaps a system, a counterfeit Christ who draws together leaders of all nations to battle Christ and his kingdom. Furthermore, I also want you to notice that verse 12 says, they will receive authority as kings for one hour along with the beast. Now, one hour clearly refers to a brief, limited time and also refers to having one purpose. And so whether these kings represent 10 specific rulers of nations or all of the world's rulers, at some point in time, there will be an alliance masterminded by Satan himself through the beast or the Antichrist for one purpose only, which we're told about in verse 13. They have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. They will wage war against the lamb, against Jesus, but the lamb will triumph over them because he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And with him will be his called, chosen, and faithful followers. This, of course, is describing what we talked about last time. The final battle after Christ returns. A battle that will be over before it starts. Because Christ is Lord and King of kings. Amen. Jesus will judge and conquer every person, every institution, every nation who opposes and dishonors him, who denies the word of God and his divine authority. In fact, in verse 17, we read that God will put it on the heart of the beast or the Antichrist, along with the leaders of the nations of the world, to carry out part of his justice by turning on the prostitute whom it says they hate and killing her and destroying her. You see, the Antichrist, like all who follow Satan, is so prideful and so self-centered, he cannot tolerate anyone who competes for the loyalty and the allegiance of Satan. To serve his own purposes, the Antichrist will tolerate and even partner with the harlot's world religious system in order to gain the respect and the support of the multitudes. But when he no longer needs her to accommodate his ends, he will utterly destroy her and the false religious system and demand that the world worship him as the world leader. Now go back to verse 6. It says this about the harlot. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. Clearly, the false religion of Babylon is anti-God and anti-Christ. It will welcome all who believe there to be many ways to God, but it will increasingly become intolerant of anyone who believes there's only one way to God and to eternal life. And of anyone who has an objective view of God, the Bible, the truth, and the ways of God, it will become increasingly intolerant of these people. In time, the prostitute and her false religious system will not just ignore 
people of faith. But this verse tells us she will martyr the people of faith. Why? Because those who follow Satan and reject God and the truth of God can't stand to be in the presence of those who have the Spirit of God within them and who live and speak the truth of Jesus Christ. And so the question is, do we see elements of the false religion of Babylon creeping into our culture and even into the church in general? Well, before I address this question, turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. In verse 1, Satan is talking to Eve. And he says, did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will, certain, you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, if you read on in that chapter, Verse 6 tells us that Adam was with Eve when Satan was saying these things to her. He wasn't off somewhere else. He was standing right next to her. So let's keep that in mind. And so in this passage, Satan tempted Eve and Adam in two ways. First, Satan tempted them to question God's truth and authority. He asked, did, did God really say in other words, are, are you sure this is true? Are, are you sure you're, you're, you're interpreting his words correctly? Are you sure that this is actually what he meant? Sec secondly, Satan tempted them to question God's goodness. Satan told them, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Satan was tempting Eve and Adam with the idea that God did not have their best interest at heart, that he was deceiving them, actually lying to them in order to keep them from reaching their potential to be like God and from making their own decisions about what's good and what's evil, about what's right and what's wrong. He was tempting them with the idea that their life would be so much freer, that their life would be so much more fulfilling and exciting if they were just to walk away from God, ignore him, and if they just took control of their own lives. You see, right from the beginning of creation, Satan has done everything in his power to get people to reject and to oppose God and to determine to be their own God, to be in charge of their own lives by tempting them to question the truth of God, to question the goodness of God, to question that he is for them and to question that he's totally trustworthy. And make no mistake, this is the heart and this is the face of the false religion of Babylon. Satan is responsible for orchestrating, energizing, and supporting a vast political, social, religious, immoral, idolatrous, and economic network that not only opposes Jesus Christ, but is seeking to destroy Christ, his word, the Bible, his followers, and all that is true, right, and good in our world. Satan and the religion of Babylon are seeking to undermine the family by breaking down traditional family values and norms 
by promoting confusion around gender roles, sexual ethics, and parental authority. Satan and the religion of Babylon are sowing division and hatred by elevating division across political, racial, and ideological lines and using mainstream media and social media to escalate polarization. Satan and the religion of Babylon are systematically corrupting our educational systems and culture, removing all forms of religious influence, objective truth, and reality in favor of relativism. They under, they're undermining critical thinking, moral absolutes, decency and sacredness in sexual relations as laid out in the scripture. Satan and the religion of Babylon continue to promote as they have down through history, consumerism, materialism, greed, and self-interest as ultimate goals in life. Satan and the religion of Babylon are fueling a culture that's obsessed with instant gratification and personal success rather than true community and selfless service to others. Satan and the religion of Babylon are attacking the sanctity of life, particularly through abortion and euthanasia, resulting in a growing tendency in society, seeing life as less valuable and disposable, leading to a callousness and a culture of death. And of course, Satan and the religion of Babylon are attacking Christians and the Christian church and with the help of Hollywood, media, and most higher institutions of learning, are characterizing Christians as outdated, intolerant, and irrelevant, and tempting church leaders to compromise on core beliefs, values, and godly living. Now here's the thing. Other than Satan, you can't point to one human person. You can't point to one institution or even a clearly identifiable group of people who belong to the religion of Babylon. The religion of Babylon is a satanically inspired worldview. It is a worldwide movement fueled by Satan himself that in various ways rejects and opposes Jesus Christ and all that Jesus and his church represent and stand for. And the religion of Babylon is seeking to seduce people to join its movement, especially people who have media, economic, political, and religious power who will play a key role in opposing Christ and the gospel of Christ. You sit down, folks, and you do a careful evaluation of the mood of our society. And you will find that our culture is tolerant of almost any group except the Christian who believes the Bible to be true and that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. You listen carefully to the narrative of mainstream media and talk shows. And you will find that Bible-believing Christians are portrayed as fanatical, uncaring, ignorant, bigoted, nasty, and even dangerous to society. Now let me be quick to add that some people who claim to be Christians are nasty. To their shame, This should not be. But so many times there are Christians who may communicate the truth but are behaving in a very unchristlike way. And in doing so are hurting the cause of Christ more than helping it. 
But that said, the reality is it is open season on Bible-believing Christians. Things that would never be said to any other religious or ethnic group are said frequently to and about Christians, often in a very nasty way, actually, without any concern of retribution. Years ago, Francis Schaeffer said, we are living in po a post-Christian era. Well, it's becoming increasingly apparent that we have moved from a post-Christian era into an anti-Christian era. And what's fueling this attitude is that in our culture, truth and justice have been replaced by tolerance. You see, years ago, the number one virtue in society was truth and justice. But that has all changed now. The number one virtue in the West especially is now tolerance. Now you say, well, what's wrong with desiring toler tolerance? Absolutely nothing. The problem is, is that tolerance, like so many other words no longer means what it used to mean. The meaning has been changed. Most of us would define tolerance the way that Webster's Dictionary does. And that is to recognize and to respect other people's beliefs and practices without sharing them or without agreeing with them. But you see, that is now being referred to in our culture as negative tolerance. So what is positive tolerance? Well, positive tolerance is this. Every person's belief, every person's values, every person's lifestyle are equal. In other words, no truth is better or greater than another truth. Your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth, and both are equally right and equally true. If you think about that for a while, you will start to lose your mind. And that is the new tolerance the religion of Babylon accepts and advocates, which means the moment you claim that your truth is greater than another person's truth, the moment you claim that one way is better than another way, the moment you claim that one lifestyle is biblical and the other is not, the moment you claim that there is only one way to God and to eternal life, you're creating a hierarchy and the religion of Babylon sees that as intolerant and intolerable. You know, Josh McDowell and his son, Sean, have given thousands of talks at hundreds of university campuses. And they say, we used to enjoy the hecklers because they would yell out things like, I don't believe that. Prove to me that Jesus rose from the dead. Prove to me that the Bible is true. Now, they say, we hardly ever hear that anymore. What we hear now is, what right do you have to say that Jesus is the only way? You're a bigot. That's intolerant. And make no mistake, the religion of Babylon is not content to live and let live. They are not satisfied with living peacefully in a pluralistic society. They are not content to just have respectful exchange of ideas. They seek not just to be equal, but they seek to dominate. That which was one time condemned must not simply be tolerated, it must be celebrated now. That which was at one time celebrated must now be condemned. Only then 
Will the religion of Babylon's vision of utopia come to pass? Because you see, they're driven by this mindset that man has the solution to what's wrong with our world. We can do this. We can build a tower. Their goal is to see the entire world embrace their beliefs and to cancel, shame, or even force dissenting voices into submission or silence. The religion of Babylon says, oh yes, you're free to exercise your freedom of speech. Go ahead. But if you do, we will make sure that you are fired from your job. We'll make sure that you're vilified, ostracized, and canceled. You know, I'm told that there is more than one half, that more than one half of millennials, over 50% of them, believe that hate speech should be banned. That gives you an idea of just how influential the worldview and the rhetoric of the religion of Babylon is becoming. Now let me be clear. If by hate speech they mean name calling, being nasty, harsh insults, taunting and threatening other people, then yes, hate speech should be banned. But in the religion of Babylon, hate speech or offensive speech includes anyone who merely disagrees with them. That's why we've got a world that everyone's offended. The religion of Babylon preaches tolerance, but practices inflexible intolerance, even to the point of violence and bloodshed against anyone who expresses, for example, a biblical point of view, or anyone who expresses a different point of view, or anyone who challenges their point of view. Writer and columnist Jonathan Van Maren, he describes an angry mob protesting outside of a library in Toronto. He writes, hostility and molten fury bubble just beneath the surface as hundreds of assembled men and women wielding signs featuring slogans such as no free speech for hate speech and launching into chants such as trans rights are human rights and take back Toronto Public Library and shame, shame, shame. So what was the offending event? A meeting of conservatives opposed to the LGBTQ agenda? A pro-life rally, perhaps? A politician denouncing socialism and cultural Marxism? No, the protests were targeted against the founder of feminist current, Megan Murphy who is a pro-abortion and pro-gay rights, but refuses to agree that men can become women or women become men. This offense got her banned from Twitter and the demonstrators accused her of being a vicious, hateful bigot. She was compared to a white supremacist. In his article, John Van Maren goes on to ask, if this is how much they hate a pro-gay feminist, and these are the lengths that they will go to in order to ruin her life, what will they do to us when they get the chance? Well, the answer to his question I believe is found in Revelation 17, 6. I saw that the woman, the religion of Babylon, was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. Now, we don't like to think of it coming to that, but we should not be surprised that one day, 
perhaps sooner than we wish to think about, it will come to that. Because the religion of Babylon has martyred millions of Christ followers down through history. This is not anything new. And we shouldn't think that we are necessarily going to escape it. So what does all this mean for us today? Well, first of all, we need to ask ourselves, where in my life am I being influenced by the religion of Babylon? 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 says, Do not love the world or the things of the world. C.J. Mahani, he writes, Today the greatest challenge facing Bible-believing Christians is not persecution from the world, but seduction by the world. And he goes on to point out that far too many Christians are living just like the world, just like the religion of Babylon. For example, how many men aren't all in for Christ, aren't serving others, aren't challenging the deceptive and destructive religion of Babylon because they believe they have lost their moral authority as a result of an addiction to pornography. How many parents' priorities for their kids look virtually identical to the priorities of parents who knowingly or unknowingly serve the religion of Babylon? How many would have to admit they, they are driven by an insatiable lust for power, for position, for money, possessions, or cultural success, and are giving their lives away to attain one or more of these things, which won't mean a hill of beans when it's all said and done. How many of us are being seduced into living the easy life, filled with pleasure, comfort, and security? The religion of Babylon loves it when we worship these temporary things and ignore God's call for our lives to make an eternal difference in the lives of others. Church, is, is God sending anyone here a wake-up call about this? A second implication is this. We must commit ourselves to knowing the truth and obeying the truth of God's word. Here's the thing. Every person needs to ask themselves this question. What is going to be the authority for my life? What's going to be the basis for my beliefs and my behaviors and my purpose in life? You see, when it comes right down to it, you have to decide between Christ or our culture, between the Word of God or the world. You must decide. If you're going to build your life on Christ and His Word, then you need to be serious about knowing it, reading it, studying it, and living it. One of the reasons the religion of Babylon is creeping into the church is because too many Christians are reading and studying everything but their Bibles. They're into, won't even get into it, all forms of media and everything else. And that's a tragedy. Because our ability to discern error or falsehood is totally dependent on knowing the truth source. And church, that means having a regular quiet time, reading, meditating on God's word, having some good biblical resources around you that help you to understand more fully what the scriptures are saying and what it means to us. It means regularly, not once a month, not when you feel like it. No, weekly. Hearing God's word taught and preached in words of services like this. It means opening up God's word. 
with other Christians. Not only giving your opinion of what you think that passage means, but no digging deeper to actually know what the writer was saying to the believers in that context. And then challenging each other to apply what all of that means for us today. Church, is God sending a wake-up call to anyone about this? And then finally, I want to remind you that God is in control. I know this is heavy stuff. But I want you to remember that nothing is beyond his awareness, beyond his power. What I've shared and what we've read here in Revelation, the last number of chapters, can be extremely disturbing if you take your eyes off Jesus and you forget that he's in control. I remind you that Revelation 16 tells us that a day is coming when God's going to say, that's it, it's enough. And he's going to pour out his wrath and his justice on Babylon and on all those who reject him and oppose him. And I also remind you of Revelation 17, verse 14, that indicates that Jesus, the Lamb, will triumph over them because he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and with him are his called, his chosen, his faithful followers. Friends, we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ our Lord. When we put our trust and faith in him, when we keep our eyes on Jesus and come to him often in praise and in prayer and come to the place where we can genuinely say that Christ is enough for me. When we can come to that place, we have nothing to fear. We have nothing to be ashamed of. Only a dynamic, joy-filled life to live to the glory of God. And for the sake of a world, for the sake of a world that needs the Jesus that we know and love. Would you please stand? Just take a moment right now. Go to the Lord and say, Lord, what are you saying to me? What are you saying to me about what I've just heard from your word? And Lord, what are you asking me to do about it? Church, I really pray that we just, to whatever extent we are, that we'll just stop playing church. We'll just stop playing religion. And we'll get serious about our relationship and our walk with Jesus. I just pray that that'll be the case. And I pray that more and more we will become a people of prayer. Because Prayer really matters. It matters more now than ever. 